Thanks for choosing this free Anfield Index podcast. If you'd prefer to listen to this or any of our other shows without adverts, then now's the time to check out Anfield Index Pro. With AI Pro, you can supercharge your entire listening experience. You'll not only get all of our podcasts without the ads, but you'll have them far faster with our quick publish feature available exclusively for subscribers. AI Pro also puts you in the heart of our sound studio, with an option to listen to many of our shows live and interact with the podcasters in real time as the shows are recording. Upgrading couldn't be easier. AI Pro is available on all popular podcast platforms, and we have our own apps for Apple and Android. Just head on over to AnfieldIndexPro.com and get started today. Hello and welcome to the Daily Red, your lunchtime catch-up on all things Liverpool FC on a Monday after Liverpool won Manchester City nil in the Premier League at Anfield. Liverpool finally kick-starting the Premier League campaign and looking very much like the team we know they're capable of being. With the news that Ibu Kanate was unlikely to play, there was obviously a lot of consternation in the fan base for a couple of days before the game. Would it be James Milner at right back, Joe Gomez centre back, or would Joe be left at right back and Nat Phillips brought in at centre back? Neither idea seemed very nice. Milner up against Phil Foden, who had absolutely roasted him a year ago, or Nat Phillips up against Erling Haaland. Very much a pick your poison moment. Jurgen Klopp went with James Milner. But that wasn't the only big decision he made. He dropped Jordan Henderson for this game. He picked Harvey Elliott on the right wing, Diogo Jota on the left wing, Fabinho and Thiago as a double pivot. He went 4-4-1-1 at home against the champions. It was the right move because he wanted them to be more solid defensively. He wanted them to get back to basics, fundamental, aggressive football. And it worked. It worked absolutely perfectly. Think back through the game. What real opportunities did City have? From the first minute, Liverpool were right up for it. And they played with a level of intensity that has been lacking pretty much all season, especially in first halves. They were physical. They were fearless. They got forward in waves. They defended in numbers. Everybody did their job. All you ever ask of players is just to do their jobs. And everybody that started in that game did their jobs absolutely perfectly. City started out in their traditional 4-3-3, but very quickly changed shape and ended up playing something that resembled a 3-6-1, where you had a Kanji... Diaz and Aki as a back three. Foden sort of having the entire left wing to himself. Canseo having the entire right wing to himself. Silva, Rodri, Gundogan and De Bruyne playing in almost a box midfield and then Haaland up front on his own. That's a lot of creativity to put around Erling Haaland. And the concern was we might be able to stop De Bruyne but can we stop him and Canseo? And if we stop both of them, can we stop Foden as well? And if we stop all of them, what about Bernardo Silva? And then what about Ilkay Gundogan? But as it turned out, in some ways, City stopped themselves with this overcomplicated system. But no, in no way does that take away from the performance of our lads yesterday. Alisson was excellent. Didn't have huge amounts to do, but everything he was asked to do, he did brilliantly. He made one really good save from Haaland, down low to his right-hand side. Everything else was pretty much straight at him, but he had to get his handling right. Milner just locked in at right back with Harvey in front of him and Joe Gomez helping across. The three of them made sure that there was no avenue for City down that left wing. And Foden got no joy. Bernardo got no joy when he went out there. 
it was the same situation on the other side with Robbo. Diogo Jota was very happy and very content to track Joe Canseo all day long and then run off him when we turned the ball over. And Canseo isn't the most diligent in his defensive work. And with Virgil helping across, City had no avenue that way either. They tried going through the middle. Fabinho and Thiago just wouldn't allow it. And when they got, when they did get the odd ball past them, Virgil and Joe Gomez were just absolutely outstanding. Bobby's work rate up front was exceptional. He looked like Bobby of old with his work rate, pressing, niggling, nipping the ball off people. And Mo was a constant threat. And Mo worked hard as well, running off the shoulder, running the channels, being a target for clearances, using his body well to manoeuvre a bit of space. Absolutely bodied Nathan Aki at one point in the first half. We created the best chance of the first half. It was great work from Mo, Milner and Harvey Elliott. Ball was whipped across. And you would have to say, when it comes to Andy Robertson, none of us probably expected him to score, but he really should be getting that shot at least on target from there. Their only notable chance in the first half was an Erling Haaland header that he headed straight into Alisson's hands. It was the one time he got clear of Gomez. And it was just his height was the issue. He's got two inches of height on Gomez and it was Kevin De Bruyne playing the pass, so you know it's going to be inch perfect. But Joe was able to send him far enough wide that he couldn't get enough purchase on the header. We went in at half time, and that was the best half of football we've played all season. Forget the first, best first half of football, I should say, we've played all season. Forget the, the Bournemouth game. That's a an aberration. This was a really, really good team performance with... Plenty of accountability. Nobody passing the book. Everybody owning up to any small mistake. Everybody been told, do better next time. Came out in the second half and Salah looked really, really up for this. And he got his first real chance as he was sent through 1v1. And credit to Ederson, it's a great save does brilliantly to get his right hand out and just touch the ball around the corner and send it past the post. Now, the referee doesn't see the touch, so the referee gives a goal kick. So from the goal kick, the ball goes up the field. Haaland gets the ball. Fabinho takes it off him. Haaland pulls Fabinho to the ground. The referee doesn't give it. Bernardo picks the ball up, plays it back through to Haaland, plays it to De Bruyne, who plays it back to Haaland. Allison comes out, gets both hands in the ball, and Haaland kicks it out of his hands. It falls to Foden, and he manages to smack it into the net off Joe Gomez's shins. But there's very clearly been two fouls in the build-up. City have their little celebration. Liverpool go and speak to the referee. The referee speaks to VAR, and VAR says, you're going to need to go and look at this. So he goes over, he has a look at the Fabinho foul, and it's very clear that Erling Haaland has a fistful of his shirt right in the armpit and just pulls him down. It's a blatant foul. It's come out afterwards that had the referee not deemed that warranting of disallowing the goal, it absolutely would have been disallowed for the Haaland on Allison one, where Allison has both hands on the ball and Haaland kicks it out of his hands. City are up in arms. Pep has himself a tantrum. Second tantrum of the day. He'd already been on the pitch at one point. He'd already crossed the line and gone onto the pitch. He should have been booked at that point. He should have been sent off for the second one. But no, doesn't happen. After the game, he's crying. Bernardo's crying. City fans are crying. And their argument is well, we'd been fouling like that all day and the referee was letting us away with it. Whatever they might be saying, that is the argument that they're making. That 
We'd seen Rodri go through the back of Salah and pull him down. We'd seen Aki pull out of Salah. Later on, we would see Bernardo Silva try and do something that resembled an RKO. And then following that, firstly, kick out at Salah and then throw his elbow into him. And that got a little heated. Mo Mo wasn't having that, went and spoke to him. Bernardo tried to get brave. Virgil came across. You could see the life drain out of Bernardo's face. Then Haaland appeared. Bernardo tried to get brave again. And Haaland basically said, I'm only here to save your life. Settle down, son. Just, he's a little rat. He's a horrible little rat. He's a brilliant player. And we'd adore him if he was ours, but he must be the most dislikable player in the league. I mean, I know people have a, a dislike of Bernard of of Bruno rather, but I don't think Bruno's as bad as Bernardo. Um, Richarlison's obviously another one in Pickford, but our views of them are tainted by the fact that you know the Everton thing. Uh, they both seem like dreadful individuals, but I don't think they're as bad as as Bernardo Silva. I genuinely don't. He just seems like an appalling person. Always whinging, always crying. Brilliant player, though. Sensational footballer. We would get our goal. City get a free kick in our half. We have everybody back, bar Mo. But Mo is 15, 20 yards inside our half. De Bruyne over hits the free kick. Allison comes and claims. And you think, right, just calm it down here. Just take take 60 seconds out of the game because it had gotten a little bit frenetic and they were starting to pile on the pressure a little bit. We'd made changes. We'd brought on Henderson for Fabinho. We'd brought on Darwin for Bobby. And we'd brought on Carvalho for Harvey Elliott. Literally a minute before this free kick, two minutes before maybe. I don't think any of them had touched the ball at this point. So you just want Ali, or you just think the best thing Ali can do here is just slow everything down. But Ali's built different. So Ali looks up and he sees Mo, and Mo is gone. Mo is heading for the end zone. So Ali launches a, an inch-perfect pass, an inch-perfect pass, and as it comes out, of Allison's hands and makes contact with his foot, Mo is just about to cross the halfway line. And Canseo has seen this and is, has dropped, keeping him on side anyway. Mo gets to Canseo, spots the ball, and just uses that incredible core strength. Canseo commits, Mo muscles him out of it, spins him, and he's away. And he's 1v1 with Ederson, with just time and opportunity between them. And having missed the first, there was no chance he was missing the second. We've seen Mo do this over and over and over again since he came to the club. And what a finish. Just passes it round the goalkeeper and into the back of the net. Anfield erupts. It's the loudest Anfield has been in a long time. And... From there, they didn't really create a whole lot. They huffed and puffed, but they didn't create a whole lot. We brought on Trent for Mo. Then we brought on Costas for Jota because Jota went down injured. Now, Darwin could have wrapped the game up for us on a couple of occasions. There was a three-on-one where Darwin just needed to shift the ball across to Mo and he didn't and he decided to shoot. It was a bad decision. Um, He got sent through one-on-one with the keeper, but he I think he was offside. And it looked like he tried to lift it over the keeper and draw a penalty. That's what it looked like. Um, but he didn't get the contact he was looking for. So um, made a bit of a hames of it. But look, I think he was offside, so it wouldn't have mattered either way. But, yeah, they didn't really create a whole lot of much. The only negative for us coming out of yesterday's game was the injury to Jota, 
which there are fears it could be a bit of a serious one and maybe he's going to miss the World Cup, um, which would be a horrible thing for him. But from a Liverpool point of view, it might not be a bad thing because say it's a an eight-week injury, he's back then pretty much in the middle of the World Cup break. So we get him back when football restarts. Mo and Diaz will both have been staying behind as well. Diaz obviously is injured and, and would actually have missed the World Cup had it gone ahead or had, had Colombia been qualified, but they weren't. So he'll be back training. Mo will be back training. You'd imagine there's a few others. Robbo, obviously, they didn't qualify. Thiago might not be picked by Spain. Joe Gomez probably won't be picked by England. Trent may not get picked by England. There's a there's a real chance Trent won't get picked by England. So the hope would be that coming off the back of that World Cup, we'll be just ready to fire, ready to go. But again, just so much credit to those lads who started yesterday and to those that came on. I thought, I thought Darwin ran them ragged. I thought Carvalho looked really intelligent with his movement, really hardworking. He looked strong. Won a couple of balls and was able to hold people off and use the ball cleverly. Uh, Henderson, so much more suited to coming off the bench, just able to go on and empty the tank out. And what was great was everybody was so locked in that as soon as he ventured a little bit out of position, he was getting pulled back into position. Mo was directing him back. Thiago was directing him back. Milner and Virgil were calling him back. So he stayed diligent in what we were asking him to do as well and gave a good account of himself in the 25 minutes or so that he was on the pitch. It just worked for everybody. And I do think this kind of 4-4-2 is something we can really build on. Now, Trent is back, which was before we expected him to be. But I do think there's merit in considering him on the right side of midfield rather than at right back, especially once Kanate is back. Because I think Gomez has done enough to earn a place in the team for a little while. So Gomez right back, Kanate uh, centre back with Virgil, that gives you more pace, more power, more aggression. Trent on the right side of midfield gives you more pace in midfield, a bit more aggression. Fab and Thiago. Now we do have an issue now at left wing where Diaz is out and Jota's out. So my suggestion is going to be to play Darwin there. Now I know he's unorthodox and I know technically he can be inconsistent, but he did play there quite a bit for Benfica. And if you had Trent slinging crosses in and Darwin arriving at the back post, that wouldn't be a bad thing. And then you keep Bobby and, and Mo as the front two. We'll obviously have some issues there with, with depth, um, but it should be enough to see us through. It should be enough to see us through. Harvey will get his games, Carvalho will get some games. Are you that person who has everything? The coolest merch and those must-have fan threads? Well, over at our Anfield Index shop, we've gone that extra mile when it comes to pimping up your Liverpool collection. From our popular range of bespoke design t-shirts, sweaters, hoodies and hats, to our signature edition mugs, prints and coasters, all provided with fast worldwide shipping. We have something for every red. We also stock official LFC merchandise and are licensed with the Premier League and UEFA to sell official iron-on shirt badges and sleeve patches. As a listener to this podcast, you can get 10% off everything with coupon code AIPRO10. Just head over to anfieldindex.shop or find us on Etsy by searching for Anfield Index. Nabi should be back soon. Ox, I think, could be a factor here. Maybe Ox gets a little bit of a run on the left of this 4-4-2. He's back in training. Curtis Jones could play, either. I think, either side, potentially in the middle of the double pivot as well if Thiago needs a break. But as long as we're being defensively solid, we're going to have a chance to win games. If we can just keep clean sheets, we can win every game we play because we've got Mo Salah. We've got 
Darwin Nunes. We've got Bobby Firmino in great form. And when Jota and Diaz come back, we have them as well. That's five match-winning players. Trent can be a match winner. I think we've seen from Harvey and Carvalho that they have that talent to be match winners. Guys that can open a game up for you and create something or in Harvey, in Fabio's case, get you a goal. So if this is what Jurgen Klopp's Liverpool 3.0 is going to look like, I'm fully on board with this. I'm building on this. And tweaking this as we go in January, in the summer next year. I'm building a team that's just really, really hard to beat and has goal threats galore. Diaz, Darwin, Salah, if they're the three that start, Diaz left, Darwin and Salah through the middle, and then Jota and Bobby, if he's still around, or somebody else replacing him off the bench. Like That's something that we can really get on board with. This is Anfield. Have plenty of post-match coverage. Uh, the main headline is best performance since April, and I think I would get on board with that. Uh, there's a couple of different sets of player ratings. Uh, well worth your while having a read. There's a piece about Mohamed Salah. Mo is Liverpool's second top Premier League goal scorer, having passed Steven Gerrard. He had been level with Gerrard on 120. He now has 121. And Robbie Fowler has 128. Mo will pass that this season. He may pass it before the World Cup break if he carries on in the form he's shown in the last two games. Isn't it amazing? You play him as a glorified linesman and wonder why he's not performing. You put him back in central areas and he gets four goals in a game and a quarter. Sensational. Absolutely sensational footballer. On Liverpool.com, Bernardo Silva Moan forgets truth Mohamed Salah knows as Liverpool would benefit from change. This is what I was talking about with the incident between the two of them where Bernardo fouls Mo, somehow gets away with it, then kicks out at him, then throws an elbow at him, uh, you would hope that the, F- the FA or the, the Premier League will look at that retrospectively because that should be a suspension. Um, there's also a piece, four things spotted in Liverpool versus Man City as X-rated Andy Robertson clash sums up big chan- a big change, uh, which is Pep Guard- The picture here is Pep Guardiola standing on the pitch. Um, he should have been booked for that. He should have been sent off then for his reaction to their goal being uh, overturned. I forgot to mention Jürgen did get sent off yesterday, but I mean, he was right to react the way he did. That that, that foul went unpunished by Bernardo was ridiculous. Um, Kevin De Bruyne sums up Liverpool midfield changes. Pep Guardiola fume, high, fume delights Harvey Elliott. Man City and Pep Guardiola expose double Liverpool hypocrisy as bold Jurgen Klopp call pays off. Lots of good stuff here. Uh, Liverpool should move for next Erling Haaland uh, as transfer needed after Jurgen Klopp change. God, this so like your Erling Haaland is twenty two. How is there already next Erling Haaland's? Datro Fafana of Molde. Let's have a look. 19, apparently 22 goal contributions this season. Um, To be fair, 17 goals in 33 games? It's not bad. I know it's the Norwegian League, but that's not bad at all. Not sure I compare him to Erling Haaland though when he's 5'11 and clearly human when Erling Haaland is a cyborg. Um, yeah, may, look, maybe you want to keep an eye on, but um, 
Diogo Jota injury latest as Liverpool make contact for double 25 million raid. Uh, Sadio, Ma- Sadio Mane was delighted with the Reds' victory over Man City on Sunday. Uh, very happy for the boys. They beat City. I couldn't watch because we were on the bus. I have a lot of faith in the boys and the coach. They'll get back to the top. That's nice to hear from Sadio. Uh, Diogo Jota is set to miss the game against West Ham and face a nervous wait to find out how bad his injury is. Hopefully it's nothing serious. Double Benfica raid. I can get on board with this. Enzo Fernandez is the one we have to get. Enzo is the one. Over everybody. Enzo over everybody, including Jude Bellingham. I'm happy for Jude to go to Real Madrid if we get Enzo. And the other one they're mentioning here is Florentino Luis, who's been partnering them this season. And they have been sensational together. Now, Florentino Luis has had a weird career. He broke through at Benfica and was immediately tagged as the next N'Golo Kante. Just a, a ball of energy, a great ball winner, someone that had a real aggressive streak to his game. And he looked really good at first, and then he never quite managed to establish himself at Benfica. So they sent him on loan to Monaco. That was a disaster. He went on loan to Hatafe last season, and that went pretty well. But what was noticeable was both times, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> both times they sent him on loan, they included options to buy. So when he went to Monaco, it was a an option to buy for 30 million euro. A year later, he's going to Tafe with an option to buy for 10 million euro. Now, Hitafe aren't a huge club, so it might be that they couldn't afford the 10 million, but the fact that they didn't take it up tells you that the season didn't go perfectly there. So he initially became a starter, was was one of the club's best perform was sorry, was the club's best performing midfielder early in the season, but following the appointment of Kike Sanchez Flores, he eventually lost his place in the team. And they were going to send him back in the January. So 24 appearances, only eight starts. So it obviously didn't go well. But this season he has been outrageous and, and they've given him a new contract um, just this past week with a buyout clause of 120 million euro. So it is, you know, we always say development isn't linear, but he's had a bizarre career thus far. Personally, I would much rather go and get Moises Caicedo. I think the price would be around the same because Benfica don't sell cheap. I would rather go and get Caicedo. He's two years younger. I think he's a better player now. I think he's got bigger upside. And I think Caicedo and Enzo, as a pair, if you brought those two in over the next two windows and you had those two plus Fabinho and Thiago, you can put any two of that four on the pitch and you're going to have a really good midfield. And you can manage Thiago's minutes. You can manage Fab's minutes. You can use those two in like big games where you want their experience and their nous. And the other two can be workhorses and get you through games with high, high quality performances. And that way, maybe you get Thiago to play on with us until he's 36, 37, because you can manage him better. He's not been asked to play more than maybe 30 games a season. And we'll be playing 60. And they could be, you know, 20 starts, 10 sub appearances for him. You just use them when you need them. And you enjoy him that way. Same with Fabinho. And you still have Curtis. You still have Henderson in limited minutes. So you'd have six for two spots. Curtis could also play, I think, on the right as a narrow right sided midfielder. Obviously, Harvey can play there. And then Carvalho is going to be more used on the left, I think. So. Diaz, Carvalho, and, and Jota would be the three options out there. And 
those two would basically box off what we need in midfield. Wouldn't we need anything else? Starting midfield of Trent, Enzo, Caicedo and Diaz, that's six, seven years with that midfield. Manage Fab and Thiago through a few years as you know, semi-regular starters, but they could be first choice for the big games. Harvey, Curtis, Carvalho, maybe you want to add one more, like a young bowl winner at some point, but those two would absolutely box off any issues for us. Um, Anfieldindex.com, there is some new podcasts, if you haven't seen, I haven't heard them. There's a new Scouts or Tommies, with Jim Boardman and Jay Reid. There is a new Money Talks with Trev Downey and Mo Chatra. There is a new post-match role. Guy had to step in for Trev. Trev threw his back out yesterday. So it was Guy, myself, and Jim Boardman. And then there was the Nina Kowser show with Kay and Mo having a look like ourselves on Raw at the Manchester City game. So do give all of those a listen. Plenty more to come this week. Things really do start to get busy from here on. We give West Ham, obviously, Wednesday, Forest at the weekend, Ajax next week in the Champions League. So games will come thick and fast up until this World Cup break. That's it from me. I will see you all tomorrow. Take care of yourselves. Bye-bye. We hope you enjoyed listening to this Anfield Index show. Please be sure to subscribe to our channel so future podcasts find their way to your device automatically. There's nothing quite like fan engagement. And we'd love to know what you think of anything discussed on this show. The best way to get in touch is over on our free Discord community, where both podcasters and listeners debate the hottest LFC topics 24-7. Sign up free now at anfieldindex.com forward slash Discord. You won't regret it. You can also follow us on Twitter at Anfield Index and find us on Facebook by searching for Anfield Index. Oh, and before you go, We'd love it if you could leave us a five-star review on your favourite podcast app. It only takes a couple of seconds, and it means the world to the people who create these free shows.